Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I think it's safe to say that this is one of the events that most of us have been most looking forward to. Um, and thank you so much to Dr. Boyle for taking the time um, to come speak to us. It's certainly most appreciated. Uh, for those of you who may not know uh, just how well accomplished our speaker tonight is, the following is just a little info. Um, he's one of the world's most four foremost experts on international law and human rights. His area Areas of expertise also include jurisprudence and U.S. constitutional law and foreign affairs. Throughout Dr. Boyle's career, he won two world court orders, one of which was overwhelmingly in favor of the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina against Yugoslavia to seize and desist from committing all acts of genocide uh, in violation of the 1948 Geneva Convention. And that was actually the first time ever that any government or any lawyer had won two such orders in one case alone um, since the World Court Order was founded in 1921. Uh, furthermore, the man before us tonight authored the Biological Weapons Anti-Terrorism Act, which was unanimously approved by both houses of Congress. Um, he's advised numerous international bodies in the areas of human rights, war crimes and genocide, uh, nuclear policy and biowarfare. He also happens to be a staunch supporter of the rights of indigenous peoples everywhere, and that's not isolated to Palestine. That also includes uh, this stolen land that we call home. And his support for indigenous peoples in the Americas was realized in 1992 uh, when Dr. Boyle participated and served as special prosecutor to the International Tribunal of Indigenous Peoples and Oppressed, Nationali Oppressed Nationalities in the USA. Um, having authored 18 books, Dr. Boyle is very well versed and very well respected to put it mildly, in the field of law and international diplomacy and politics. So on behalf of the UIUC Divest Campaign, Students for Justice in Palestine, and our seven co-hosts, I'd like to welcome Harvard Law Educated and uh, University of Illinois professor and international human rights lawyer, Francis A. Boyle. Well, thank you very much for that kind of generous uh, introduction, and uh, it's very nice uh, to be speaking here again before the uh, Students for Justice in Palestine. Palestinians have been victims of genocide as defined by the 1948 Genocide Convention uh, since the founding of the State of Israel, and indeed before that. I say that because of my practical experience. Yes, as the uh, introducer said, I single-handedly won two world court orders for the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina against Yugoslavia, Serbia, and Montenegro to cease and desist from all acts of genocide against the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This was the first time ever that any lawyer, let alone government, had won two world court orders in one case since the world court was founded in 1921. If you are interested, all of my oral and written submissions to the world court on genocide and those two world court orders overwhelmingly in favor of Bosnia can be found in this book, The Bosnian People Charge Genocide, which is also on reserve in the uh, law school uh, library. Article 2 of the Genocide Convention defines the international crime of genocide in relevant part as follows. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. A, killing members of the group. B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its destruction, its physical destruction, in whole or in part. That's exactly what Israel is doing to the 1.8 million people of Gaza today, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about their physical destruction 
in whole or in part. And they have been doing this since they imposed their siege on Gaza starting in 2001. DACA, sorry, Gaza is just like the Dachau concentration camp that I have visited myself. As documented by Israeli historian Elon Pape in his seminal book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, Israel's genocidal po policy against the Palestinians has been unremitting, extending from before the foundation of the State of Israel in 1948, and is ongoing even now, and especially intensifying against the 1.8 million Palestinians living in Gaza. We must never forget them. And I have been all up and down and back and forth in Gaza myself. As Pape's analysis established, Zionist's final solution to Israel's much touted and racist and genocidal demographic threat allegedly posed by the very existence of the Palestinians has always been genocide, whether slow motion or in bloodthirsty spurts of violence, as we have seen. Uh, Ap Operation Cast Lead, uh, Operation Protective Edge, uh, both euphemisms for genocide against the Palestinians and the people in Gaza. Indeed, the very essence of Zionism requires ethnic cleansing and acts of genocide against the Palestinians. Again, Operation Cast Lead, UN General Assembly President Miguel Descoto Brockman from Nicaragua, and I've been down to Nicaragua and for many years helped the Nicaraguan people against the Reagan-Contra war. You can read this in my book, Defending Civil Resistance Under International Law. Brockman, the UN General Assembly, uh, uh, and also Foreign Minister of Nicaragua during the Reagan's Contra Terror War of Aggression against Nicaragua, condemned, and that was condemned by the World Court, by the way, called what was going on in Gaza, quote, genocide, unquote. And I agree with Brockman, and I have helped his people for many years against the Reagan terror contra war uh, against them. Israel and its predecessors in law, the Zionist agencies, forces, and terrorist games have committed genocide against the Palestinian people that started on or about 1948, May 14th, Nakba Day. And you'll know that President Trump has decided to stick it to the Palestinian people by illegally moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and has already legal, illegally recognized Jerusalem as the capital of the state in Israel for the first time ever. And if you want, in my book, Palestine, Palestinians, and International Law, I have an entire chapter on the legal status of Jerusalem under international law. And it is quite interesting that the last time we had an official statement on Jerusalem was by George Bush Sr. when he was uh, the United Nations ambassador and correctly pointed out the reasons why the United States government had not previously recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and kept our embassy in Tel Aviv. And I have been to that embassy in Tel Aviv to complain vigorously about the war crimes that Israel has inflicted uh, against the Palestinians. And you know what they told me? This was an internal affair of Israel. That's what they told me at that U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv. So in other words, the United States government was not going to get involved, was not going to do anything at all about it. And if I didn't agree with that, I could take it up with the State Department in Washington, D.C. Well, of course, that would be a waste of time, uh, as we all know. 
certainly Israel and its predecessors in law, these Zionist agencies, forces, and terrorist gangs, committed genocide against the Palestinians that started on Nakba Day in 1948 and continue to pace until today in violation of genocide conventions, Article 2, A, and B, and C, that I quoted to you already. For over the past seven decades, the Israeli government and its predecessors in law, the Zionist agencies, forces, and terrorist gangs, have ruthlessly implemented a systematic and comprehensive military, political, religious, economic, and cultural campaign with intent to destroy, in substantial part, the national, ethnical, racial, and different religious groups constituting the Palestinian people here, Muslims and Christians. And we just saw last week that the Christian denominations in charge of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher had to shut it down because Israel and the Zionists are trying to tax it out of existence in violation of the Hague Conventions of 1907, the four Geneva Conventions of 1949, and other rules of customary international law binding on Israel. The Zionists could not give diddly squat about international law, and I have been up against them for decades, both Israel and here and all over the world. I've debated them, I've argued them, I've opposed them. They all lie, every one of them that I have ever dealt with personally, and that includes the people at the State Department. Indeed, it was so bad that when I was the lawyer for the Palestinians at the Middle East peace negotiations, the State Department would lie to them, literally lie to them, about documents that they had drawn up for the Palestinians to sign in English. And the Palestinians would bring them back to me with the State Department notes as to what they said these documents meant. I said, well, that's a lie, this is a lie, the other thing is a lie. Just bold-faced lies by the State Department. The United States has never been an honest broker when it comes to the Palestinians. I have been there from the outset of the Middle East peace negotiations in 1991 with my client and friend, the late great Dr. Haider Abdel Shafi from Gaza itself and head of the Palestinian Red Crescent Society. It's a shocking disgrace what the U.S. government has done to the Palestinians from the very outset of these negotiations in 1961 and still continuing today under Kushner, uh, Greenblatt, Black, and Friedman. Do you really think we're going to get peace between Israel and the Palestinians from three Orthodox Jews? Of course not. And to show you how bad it was, back in 1991, at the beginning of these peace negotiations, Bush Sr. put three American Jews in charge of the process, Ross, Miller, and Curzon. And they even later admitted, yes, they always served as Israel's Lord, which is true. I was there up against them. Notice, nothing has changed from 1991 uh, until today. It's still three American Jews in charge of these so-called peace negotiations serving as lawyers for Israel. I remember uh, telling my client and friend at these peace negotiations, uh, Hannah Nashwari, that this was un-American. And she smiled very politely looking at me and I could tell what was on her mind. No, this is typically American. Typically American when it comes to the Palestinians. I can tell you that I've been there for a long time dealing with these people and opposing them for the Palestinians. 
This Zionist Israeli campaign has consisted of killing members of the Palestinian people in violation of Genocide Convention Article 2A. This Zionist Israeli campaign has caused serious bodily and mental harm to the Palestinian people in violation of Genocide Convention Article 2B. The Zionist Israeli campaign has deliberately inflicted on the Palestinian people conditions of life calculated to bring about their physical destruction in substantial part in violation of Article 2C of the Genocide Convention and particularly in Gaza today as we speak 1.8 million uh, 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 Palestinians uh, being treated almost as if they were the Jews at Dhaka. Apologists of Israel uh, have argued that since these mass atrocities are not tantamount to the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews, therefore they do not qualify as genocide. Previously, I had encountered and refuted this completely disingenuous, deceptive, and bogus argument against labeling genocide for what it is. When I was the lawyer for the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, arguing their genocide case against Yugoslavia, both Serbia and Montenegro, before the International Court of Justice. There, the genocidal Yugoslavia was represented by Shabtai Rosen from Israel. Think about that. Israel, their top international lawyer, was representing the Yugoslav genociders against the Bosnians. Indeed, in these proceedings, he listed himself as ambassador at large from Israel. Why? Israel was supporting the Yugoslav war of extermination against the Bosnians, including against the Bosnian Jews, who were my clients as well. And I acted to try to protect them, the Bosnian Jews, Muslims, Croats, and others at the World Court. Rosen from Israel proceeded to argue to the World Court that since he was an Israeli Jew, what Yugoslavia had done to the Bosnians was not the equivalent of the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews, and therefore did not qualify as genocide within the meaning of the 1948 Genocide Convention. You can see the transcript right here if you want to read it. The live transcript of the oral arguments and debates between Rosen and me. I rebutted Rosen by arguing to the World Court that you do not need the equivalent to the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews in order to find that wholesale atrocities against the civilian population constitute genocide in violation of the 1948 Convention. Indeed, the entire purpose of the Genocide Convention was to prevent another Nazi Holocaust against the Jews. That is why Article 1 of the Genocide Convention clearly provided, quote, the contracting parties confirm that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law which they undertake to prevent and to punish. Let me repeat that. To prevent. That's what the BDS campaign is all about. That is why we are here tonight, to prevent the, jo the Zionist genocide against the Palestinians that is still going on today, including and especially in Gaza. In support of my successful 1993 genocide argument to the World Court for Bosnia, I submitted to the World Court that Article 2 of the Genocide Convention expressly provided, quote, in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part 
a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. Let me repeat, or in part. In other words, that to be guilty of genocide, a government did not have to intend to destroy the whole group as the Nazis intended to do with the Jews. Rather, a government can be guilty of genocide even if it intends to destroy a mere part of the group, whole or in part. Certainly, Yugoslavia uh, intended to exterminate all the Bosnian Muslims if they could have gotten away with it, as manifested by their subsequent mass extermination of 7,000 Bosnian Muslim men and boys at Srebrenica in July of 1995. I would later become the attorney of record for the mothers of Srebrenica and the women of Srebrenica at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. In that capacity, I convinced the ICTY prosecutor Carla Del Ponte to indict Yugoslav President Slobodan Milosevic for every crime in the ICTY statute for atrocities he inflicted upon the Bosnians, including two counts of genocide, one count of genocide for Bosnia in general, and the second count of genocide for Srebrenica in particular. Notice 7,000 was enough to constitute genocide as far as the ICTY was concerned and in repeated rulings by the, world, by the ICTY for Srebrenica. Milosevic died while on trial in The Hague after the ICTY itself denied his motion to dismiss these charges after the close of the prosecution's case and kept the two charges for genocide, genocide in general in Bosnia and genocide in particular against the 7,000 Bosnian Muslim men and boys at Srebrenica. I argued to the world court that at that point in time, the best estimate was that Yugoslavia had exterminated 250,000 Bosnians out of a population of about 4 million Bosnians, including therein about 2.5 million Bosnian Muslims. Therefore, I argued to the world court that these dead victims constituted a, quote, substantial part of the group and the appropriate interpretation of the words in part set forth in Article 2 of the Genocide Convention should be interpreted as a, quote, substantial part. The World Court agreed with me overwhelmingly and emphatically rejected Rosen's specious, reprehensible, and deplorable arguments. So they issued their first order to me on 8 April 1993 that Yugoslavia must cease and desist from committing all acts of genocide against the Bosnians both directly and indirectly by means of their Bosnian Serb surrogates. This was the international equivalent of the US domestic temporary restraining order and conjunction, injunction combined. The same was true for the second world court order with three additional measures of protection that I won for Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the same was true for an article 74 paragraph 4 order I won for Bosnia against Yugoslavia from the world court on August 5. In its final judgment on the merits of the Bosnia case issued in 2007, the world court definitively agreed with me once and for all time that in order to constitute genocide, a state must only intend to destroy a, quote, substantial part, unquote, of the group as such. They must not intend to destroy the entire group, as Rosen argued, but only a substantial part. 
And here, uh, well, I won't go through the uh, uh, language here. Uh, you can find it in my uh, other writings. So, in other words, based on these world court rulings and rulings also by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, to find Israel guilty of genocide against the Palestinians. It is not required to prove that Israel has the intention to exterminate all Palestinians. Rather, all that is necessary is to establish that Israel intends to destroy a substantial part of the Palestinians. And that they have certainly done. Intifada 1. The Al-Aqsa Intifada 2. Operation Cast Lead. Operation Protective Edge. And the list of these things goes on and on. Furthermore, in paragraph 293 and 4 of its 2007 Bosnian Judgment, the World Court found that you did not even need 250,000 exterminated Bosnians to constitute genocide, let alone 6 million dead Jews. Rather, even the 7,000 exterminated Bosnian Muslim men and boys at Srebrenica were enough to constitute genocide. Uh, applying the same tests to Israel, it, their treatment and their Zionist predecessors too, and their Zionist supporters today, clearly constitute genocide as interpreted by these decisions by the World Court and the International Criminal Tribunal uh, for the former Yugoslavia. Starting in 1948, Israel obliterated 500 Palestinian villages from off the face of the earth, literally reducing them to rubble now scattered across the Palestinian countryside in order to prevent their ethnically cleansed inhabitants from ever again returning to their homes because their homes no longer exist. I have also been all up and down Palestine. I have seen the ruins of these villages myself with my own eyes. And I have protested this uh, to the uh, highest ranking officer in charge of the military occupation of Palestine, the legal officer, military officer. And uh, when I said these are uh, Nuremberg crimes uh, that you are inflicting on the Palestinians, and I said this to his own, in his own office on the West Bank, uh, he pleaded the so-called defense of necessity. And I said, well, necessity was rejected at the Nuremberg Tribunal in 1946 when the lawyers for the Nazis made those arguments at that time. And do you know what he told me? His words were, well, we have public relations people in the United States that take care of these matters for us. So in other words, he didn't disagree with anything I was saying. He basically conceded. It was all a matter of public relations here in the United States. Indeed, then I met with the legal advisor to the foreign ministry of Israel, and he gave me the same answer. And finally, I met with the uh, lawyer for the Ministry of Injustice in Israel, in his office, and he gave me the same answer. He didn't dispute my arguments. Basically, he conceded them. What Israel is doing to the Palestinians are Nazi crimes. But all they care about is public relations here in the United States. And that's where you people come in. 
you must change public relations here for them in the United States. And BDS is the most effective way uh, to do this. The list of Israeli genocidal massacres of Palestinians is quite extensive. I won't go through it here today. To just name a few of Israel's most notorious acts of genocide against the Palestinians, Der Yassin, Tantura, Sabra, and Shatia. Yes, I was the attorney of record for five women who were next of kin of the 3,500 Palestinian old men, women, and children who were exterminated at Sabra and Shatia, surrounded by the Israeli army and acting under the command of General Yaron, whom I sued for them, for all of them. Sabra and Shatia, indeed, even the UN General Assembly passed a resolution determining that this massacre of Sabra and Shatia, 1982, constituted genocide. Janine, Nablus, and again, repeatedly and continuously in Gaza, and they are threatening another act, series of acts of genocide against the people of Gaza as we speak today. To repeat, Israel is, quote, deliberately inflicting on the 1.8 million Palestinians in Gaza conditions of life calculated to bring about their physical destruction in whole or in part in gross and flagrant violation of Genocide Convention, Article 2C. And the United States government supports this. Even the great Obama, who was behind me at Harvard Law School, supported it. Did nothing to stop it. And, of course, Trump, the word Trump, speaks for itself. <laughs> Article 1 of the Genocide Convention requires the contracting parties confirm that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law which they undertake to prevent and to punish. And that is why we are here tonight to prevent Zionist genocide against the Palestinians. All right? And it is clear that Netanyahu and his gang of criminals are trying to provoke another intifada by the Palestinians uh, so that they can slaughter them again, just like they did in the Al-Aqsa intifada so that they can slaughter them again, as they have repeatedly done in Gaza. Now, that being said, let me briefly review the history of the BDS campaign. After the Al-Aqsa Intifada that was deliberately provoked by that war criminal and genocidaire, Ariel Sharon, at Al-Aqsa, where I have been, on the Haram al-Sharif, where you have Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock, where Muhammad ascended to heaven. And he went up there with the approval of Prime Minister Barak and provoked the Palestinians and shot dead deliberately many of them, trying to save and rescue Al-Aqsa. And remember, as we speak today, the Palestinians at the Haram are trying to defend Al-Aqsa day in and day out for these fanatical Zionist Jewish settlers and religious fanatics that want to go in there and destroy Al-Aqsa and build their so-called third temple. This is a very dangerous situation, I kid you not, 
And now that uh, Trump is president, anything could happen. We could lose Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock and the Haram to these fanatical religious Zionist Jews. We could. And that would have the full support of President Trump. I know of no restraint on this administration when it comes to the Palestinians. So it seemed to me that uh, with the provocation of the Al-Aqsa Intifada, even as determined and condemned by a UN Security Council resolution, that the so-called peace process was over, that I had started out with in 1991 with Dr. Abdul Shafi. And I can assure all of you that Dr. Abdul Shafi was tough as nails at these peace negotiations. He would not compromise with the Zionists in terms of selling out the basic rights of the Palestinians under international law. Yes, we were prepared to make compromises, but not at the expense of the basic rights of the Palestinians under international law. And again, uh, that story is told in my book, Palestine, Palestinians and International Law. Dr. Abdul Shafi kindly gave me permission to write about it. I was his lawyer, so attorney-client conferences, but he gave me permission to write about it. It's here. And in addition, in my book, The Palestinian Right of Return, you'll see press conferences by both Dr. Abdul Shafi and Hanan Ashwari uh, that I chaired in Washington, D.C. on the Palestinian Right of Return under Resolution 194, which Trump has said, sorry, uh, we just don't care about that anymore. We're going to take that off the table, just as we've now taken Jerusalem off the table. Well, if you read the Oslo Accords, uh, you will see that they said quite clearly that all final status issues remain open, including the right of return and Jerusalem. It is not for Trump to take any of these issues off the table. Even Israel signed the Oslo Accord under Rabin. So it was clear to me that both Labour and Likud, Tweedledum versus Tweedledee, as far as I'm concerned, I've dealt with lawyers and officials on both sides, there's no difference between the two. Uh, the peace negotiations were dead as a doornail the second Al-Aqsa Intifada was on. And my friend Professor Jamal Nassar, uh, who at that time was chair of the political science department at Illinois State University, asked me to give a public lecture on this whole series of events, which I did do. And in that lecture, November 30th, 2000, I publicly issued an appeal for the establishment of an international campaign of divestment and disinvestment against Israel on the grounds and for the same reason that we had a campaign of divestment and disinvestment against the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa. And I was involved in large numbers of cases in this campaign, defending anti-apartheid resistors. You can read about it in this book, including obtaining the first acquittal ever of anti-apartheid protesters up at Chicago at the South African consulate, uh, Chicago versus Streeter. We even made the New York Times uh, on that one. I know apartheid when I see it. I've litigated it all over this country. 
And so I issued this appeal for divestment and disinvestment against Israel for the same reasons we had against the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa. Apartheid was going on in Israel and far worse than that. Now, I won't go through all the history here, except the uh, next uh, major development was that the president of Harvard University, where I have three degrees and is diehard Zionist, Larry Summers, condemned those of us involved in the Harvard divestment, disinvestment campaign as anti-Semitic. He publicly condemned us, including me. What a coward. <laughs> and of course, Summers is a diehard Zionist himself and tried to impose his neocon Zionist agenda on Harvard. Indeed, Harvard is so bad that my friend Edward Said, whom you know about, was offered Harvard's top honcho chair in comparative literature and was not going to take it. So the Palestinians asked me to meet with Edward Said and convince him to take Harvard's top honcho chair in comparative literature. Harvard, uh, uh, Edward had gotten his PhD in comparative literature from Harvard. So I spent an entire evening at a Chinese restaurant on the campus of Columbia University trying to convince Edward to take Harvard's top honcho chair in comparative literature. Most professors would give their right arm for a, any chair at Harvard. I spent a whole evening arguing with Edward. I can be quite persuasive. <laughs> I got nowhere. And finally, Edward said to me, based on his personal experience at Harvard, he said, Harvard is so anti-Palestinian that it would thwart my intellectual creativity to go to Harvard. Now think about that. That's Edward Said, one of the great intellectuals of the world, saying Harvard was so anti-Palestinian that it would thwart his intellectual creativity to go there. And of course, Edward was right. So after Summers uh, condemned me and the rest of us as anti-Semitic, WBUR <laughs> radio station in Boston, which is the NPR affiliate in Boston, called me up and said, would you be willing to debate Summers for one hour live on the radio with Collins? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. They then called up Summers. He refused to debate me. <laughs> he did not have the courage and the integrity and the principles to debate me. Well, later, Harvard fired Larry Summers for imposing his Zionist neocon agenda even further on Harvard and his other scurrilous charge that women are dumber than men when it comes to math and science. Well, as a triple Harvard alumnus, I say good riddance to Larry Summers. So then WBUR asked me, would you debate Dershowitz? I said, sure, I'm happy to debate Dershowitz. So Dershowitz and I uh, had this debate. Uh, it's 2002, uh, September. There's still a link on there on WBUR dealing with this uh, scurrilous charge that those of us involved uh, in the divestment, disinvestment campaign were anti-Semitic. And Dershowitz is supposed to be the best the Zionists have to offer. 
I clobbered him. It was so bad that during the debate, Dershowitz admitted that I was the expert on international law and human rights. Well, at least Summers was smart enough not to debate me. That's all I can say, uh, unlike uh, Dershowitz. And by the way, Dershowitz is a war criminal. Yes, he admitted in an interview he gave to law professor Ali Khan that he was a member of a Mossad committee that approved the murder and assassination of Palestinians. The murder and assassination of Palestinians violates the Geneva Conventions. It is a war crime. So the next time you see Dershowitz up there on TV, just remember, one, I clobbered him, and two, <laughs> two, he's a war criminal. That uh, debate, 25 September 2002, it's the best debate out there refuting charges, scurrilous charges, that people involved in the BDS campaign are anti-Semitic. Now, I won't go through uh, the rest of this history here, except that in 2005, Palestinian civil society leaders contacted me and said they wanted to set up a boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign along the lines of the campaign, successful campaign, of, uh, against apartheid South Africa. Would I go in with them? I said I would. And so today we have the BDS campaign. Boycott, divestment, sanctions. I am D in BDS. I'm happy to be here uh, speaking with you uh, this evening. As you know, two weeks ago, the BDS campaign was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by a Norwegian parliamentarian. And the Nobel Peace Prize is given out in Norway. So I think the BDS campaign has at least an inside track, perhaps, on winning that Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, it's always a crapshoot who wins those things. I mean, they gave one to Obama, right? <laughs> and before that, they gave one to Henry Kissinger. Uh, I went through the same program in political science uh, that produced Kissinger uh, before me and had his old office at Harvard's Center for International uh, Affairs. And for someone of my generation, that Nobel Peace Prize has always been the Kissinger War Prize. But who knows? Uh, maybe they will come through for the BDS campaign. Uh, I don't know. But that brings us here today and tonight. What can you do here? on the BDS campaign for the University of Illinois and this surrounding community. We had a very active campaign against the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa when I arrived here in 1978 and I immediately joined it. Again, I won't go through the whole history of that here, including three of our students who were maliciously prosecuted by the University of Illinois simply for holding up signs in the Illini Union saying, divest now. And then they were subjected to a kangaroo court criminal prosecution over here in Champaign County uh, by Judge Townsend. But that was it. Only three of them 
they declined our opportunity, uh, our offer to appeal. I thought we had a good chance to win uh, on appeal. Did some community service. They're graduating seniors and uh, moved on with their life. Indeed, there was a law student also involved and the uh, fascist dean of the law school instituted proceedings against him, disciplinary proceedings. And I had to go in there uh, and help defend him so that he could continue on with his legal career, which he did. So in 1987, the University of Illinois Board of Trustees divested from the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa. Now think about that. 1987, there was a campaign. There was a struggle. But eventually we got the University of Illinois Board of Trustees to divest from the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa. And divestment took place all over the country. Northwestern, other, I was involved uh, helping defend uh, those students up there. Harvard partially, selectively uh, divested. I was involved in helping uh, defend uh, the uh, alumni, uh, Harvard alumni there. Uh, the University of Chicago, my disalma mater, uh, where I got my undergraduate degree, diehard, racist, bigoted, Zionist for sure. They refused to divest and were proud of it. Certainly don't go to the University of Chicago for any reason, believe me. But we divested because of the student struggle. Well, we did it before, we can do it again. My, my advice to you all then, set up a committee, go out, read the back pages of the Daily Alina that covered our struggle against the criminal apartheid regime here uh, in the University of Illinois starting at least when uh, I showed up here in 1978 until 1987. Study the strategy and tactics that were used by the students for that struggle. It's all there in the daily alignment. And then come up with your own strategy and tactics to apply here and those of you who graduate from here who go elsewhere. So this is not a case of anyone reinventing the wheel here. We have the wheel. Uh, and indeed, the legal arguments against the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa are all in here, including the brief we filed in Chicago versus Streeter and all the arguments against the criminal, genocidal, apartheid regime in Israel uh, are in my three books here. So the legal arguments are all there, but we need you. We need organization. We need a strategy. We need action. Remember, the 1.8 million Palestinians living in Gaza today are at risk. They are counting on us to come through for them. Thank you. Professor Voyle for that very thorough and exceptional examination um, of your legal history and of the boycott divest sanction movement as a whole. 
Um, I think it's important to note that as students of the university and as students of the movement that we need to emphasize really the importance of the power in numbers. So that's why I'd like to thank everyone who did vote um, to get the UIUC divest uh, petition on the ballot. We're still awaiting whether or not we did receive that, but we've grown well, very well accustomed to the fact that it is in fact a well, an uphill battle. Um, and uh, just like University of Michigan and other universities were uh, able to get on their referendum and on their ballot, um, we'll be finding out in the very near future. So uh, just like Professor Boyle had mentioned, uh, the success of schools and institutions across the U.S. is part of the initiative to divest from South African apartheid and our current divest campaign is also um, by extension uh, an international movement and we too are following the examples of other universities and um, activists across the world. So if not us then and if not now, when? Um, so now I'm going to be opening the floor to a question and answer session. I just ask that there be no shouting um, and that everyone respects our speaker. Um, and if you're going to be interested in asking a question, just state your name followed by the question and um, I will be calling on you. So the floor is open to anyone who's interested. It's all so clear. <laughs> Could be a comment as well. Would you have any comments you'd like to make? Any words of encouragement to anyone? Uh, so, I... uh, so my question, comment, I guess, is what would be your advice for student activists on this campus, not just as youth, but uh, with the recent rise in like, um, action taken against activists or false accusations, especially because even when we prove our innocence, we're always having to be on the defensive and always having to like, prove that we're not in the wrong, but like it should already be known that we're in the right, so we shouldn't be having to defend that right constantly. So what would your, I guess, advice? Yes, um, <clears throat> well, yeah, it's, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, uh, during my career, Zionists have uh, accused me of being everything but a child molester. <laughs> uh, it just comes with the territory. And my response is that uh, Zionists are more loyal to Israel than the United States of America. And that's been my experience since I entered the diehard Zionist neocon University of Chicago in 1968. So uh, that is my usual response, except if you wish, you can hear this uh, debate between uh, Dershowitz and me. You know, Dershowitz is uh, Israel's go-to guy here in the United States. And whenever they want dirty work done, they ask Dershowitz to do it. So uh, you can hear that debate if you want. You're just, you know, you're going to have to um, develop the hide of a rhinoceros. And don't let anyone intimidate you uh, here and what's at stake. And if Zionists attack you, you say, yeah, you people are more loyal to Israel than you are the United States. I'm a loyal American citizen. I'm exercising my First Amendment rights. And if you don't like it, you can stuff it. Go, go to Israel. Fine. Hi, I'm Sam. I work uh, for Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm curious what you know about uh, lawfare, as people are calling it, what sort of tactics that Zionist groups here in the U.S. are using um, legal tactics that they're using to undermine the BDSU and what we can do about it. Yes, well, um, <clears throat> my response to uh, that, which it, it, it's too little and too late. Uh, I let this genie out of the bottle in 2000, and I knew at that time, it was going to spread like wildfire uh, all over the United States and the world. So after many years of just ignoring the BDS, finally uh, they've decided to set up a ministry over there in Israel. Uh, 
and uh, launch this uh, uh, lawfare campaign. But you know, they're not winning. They're losing across the board. Um, and uh, uh, it, if you have problems, there's now a uh, Palestinian legal center in Chicago that is winning cases. And my friends at the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, which I've worked with for uh, many years, and very uh, courageous people, and many of them are Jewish, these lawyers. They're outstanding. Uh, and they agree with me, indeed. They've taken the position uh, that uh, this is genocide going on here. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, you just need to keep soldiering on. Yes, you will be threatened. Uh, indeed, there was a group of, uh, I don't know, three or maybe four Zionist uh, members of Congress uh, who filed a complaint with a formal complaint with the Department of uh, uh, Commerce demanding that I be investigated and prosecuted uh, just for exercising my First Amendment rights here uh, as a U.S. citizen to set up that divestment uh, disinvestment campaign. Nothing came of it. So yes, you'll be threatened, and especially uh, if, if you're Jewish. Uh, uh, my experience, for what it's worth, is that uh, Zionists are worse to Jews who resist them uh, than, than the rest of us. You know, they, they accuse you of being self-hating Jews and this, that, and the other thing. I remember uh, I invited my friend uh, Norman, Norman Finkelstein to come down here to lecture from DePaul University before they fired him uh, uh, illegally and unjustifiably at, at the behest of Dershowitz and, and his followers. Uh, and all over the uh, law school uh, uh, computer system, they were there accusing uh, Norman of being a self-hating Jew. And as you know, his, his mother is a Holocaust survivor. Uh, so I introduced uh, uh, Norman, and I, I dealt with this charge. And I said, you know, Norman reminds me of Noam Chomsky. Uh, and of course, they're friends. And uh, Chomsky uh, has been a leader of the peace and justice movement, other, uh, to my knowledge, since the Vietnam War. Uh, so uh, I, I think you, you, know, you just have to be comfortable with who you are um, and, and move forward. Uh, because right now, I, I'm afraid that this is all the Palestinians have. Uh, now with Trump uh, weighing in against them, uh, it doesn't look good at all. The reports I've, I've read of whatever this so-called peace plan is, it's basically going to be a surrender plan. You know, it's sort of like the uh, uh, godfather uh, making an offer you can't refuse. You know, with Luca Brasi pointing a gun at your head and saying, you know, either your, your name will be on that paper or your brains will be on the table. I'm afraid that's what they're going to do to President Abbas. And as we both know, I bet that's not going to work. Uh, I don't think it's going to work. And I do want to say, you know, it, based on my uh, work at the Palestinian, uh, at the Middle East peace negotiations in uh, 1991 to 1993, we could have had peace. I was advising both the Palestinians and the Syrians. Uh, the Jordanians, everyone knew they wanted peace with Israel, but they couldn't go first, and eventually there was a, a peace treaty, fine. Uh, at that time, uh, regretfully, Lebanon was uh, occupied by Syria, courtesy of President Bush Sr., uh, so the Lebanese did what the Syrians told them to do. So I knew both the Palestinian and the Syrian positions. Indeed, I was drafting their papers. We could have had peace. Um, and when uh, Prime Minister Rabin uh, came in, of course, he signed the Oslo Accord. Then uh, he moved to a comprehensive peace treaty with Syria. Uh, and that peace treaty, which I advised the Syrians on, uh, 
was modeled on the peace treaty uh, with Egypt. That is full peace for full withdrawal from the territories Israel stole in 1967. That peace treaty was ready to go at the end of 1995. But Rabin held it back from the Knesset because an election was coming up. He didn't want to make it part of an election uh, issue. And as you know, he was murdered and assassinated by a uh, religious fanatic uh, with the support of Netanyahu and, and others of his ilk at that time. And that was the end of the peace process. There has been no uh, uh, further development to speak of uh, since uh, Rabin's um, uh, murder and assassination. And there we are today. Indeed, uh, President Arafat said, uh, I lost my partnership, my partner for peace when uh, Rabin was murdered. Uh, I wish I could give better advice, but look, as I see the BDS campaign, we have truth and justice on our side. And we just need to keep arguing truth and justice and bring it out to the American people. That's what we did in the campaign against the criminal apartheid regime in South Africa. We brought our arguments and our activities out to the American people. As we all know, Congress is completely bought off by the Zionist lobby. And the White House these days, as we see, there's no hope there. So we have to take our, our campaign out to the American people and educate. Uh, yeah, it's work. That's true. And not just education, but also organization, action, uh, protest, demonstrations. Just look at how the students here at the University of Illinois accomplish this to get the UI Board of Trustees to divest. And I can assure you that that criminal apartheid regime in, in South Africa that I was up against for all those years, they hired some of the top law firms and lobbying firms in this country uh, to oppose what we were doing. But eventually they lost because we had truth and justice on our side. And today there is no apartheid regime in South Africa. Sure, they have their problems. <laughs> we have a lot of problems here. Uh, but apartheid isn't one of them. Uh, but it still is going to take a lot of work uh, for us to get to that point uh, for Israelis and Palestinians. They've won one case already, and more have been filed. And I think the uh, ACLU is doing good work in this area, too, for sure. Uh, so you've got that Palestine Legal Center up in Chicago. You have the ACLU. Uh, my friends uh, at the Center for Constitutional Rights uh, in New York, um, you know, there are a lot of lawyers working to combat the uh, lawfare campaign. but. At the, at the end of the day, I think the reason the Department of Commerce did not take any legal action against me was the conclusion I was just exercising my First Amendment rights as a citizen of the United States of America. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the First Amendment, you know, it's lose it or use it. <laughs> you got to go out and do it. Well, the individual states that have passed that legislation have to prosecute on behalf of the First Amendment, right? Well, they, they're, they're defending everywhere on the grounds of the First Amendment. They, they can't do it for the whole country. Pardon me? They can't do it to the Supreme Court. They, they bring it 
Well, it could take it to the Supreme Court, but uh, uh, and I'm not defending the current Supreme Court. I mean, it's pretty right-wing uh, and and reactionary. Uh, I hate to say, uh, 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 the majority of them uh, went to Harvard Law School and were brainwashed to be right-wing uh, and reactionary, uh, except for uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg. Uh, and uh, 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 Justice Sotomayor, she went to uh, Yale Law School. But they have taken a very strong stand in support of the First Amendment. So I would think even if any of these cases made it up to the Supreme Court, uh, our First Amendment rights would be vindicated, even though the Supreme Court these days, I say, except for uh, uh, Ginsburg and uh, Sotomayor, pretty pretty reactionary. But but they've had a, they're they're very good on the First Amendment. Now another round of applause and a final thank you to Dr. Boyle. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and again to our seven co-hosts. If you'd like to learn more about the Divest Campaign, um, you're welcome to liking our uh, Facebook page, which is SJP UIUC and the UIUC Divest page.